Until the late 19th century, historical study was primarily concerned with interpreting texts, either literature that talked about the past, what we would call histories, or documents that recorded some event, the archives. Today, well, to be honest, since at least the early 20th century, historians have taken a much broader view of what constitutes a primary source, incorporating archaeology, numismatics, and art history, amongst other things. But there is still a lot of work with texts. And even when work is extended to material culture, the techniques for interpreting texts have proven transferable. So let's talk about the concept of readings, in the plural. Historians often use visual metaphors, lenses, filters, gazers, etc., to talk about the different ways you can read a text. I'm not going to bother arguing a well-established point. There are a lot of ways you can read the same text, and you always should read a text in multiple ways if you hope to say anything worthwhile about it. If you want a metaphor, you can think of different readings as akin to the plan, front, and side elevation of a building, which while none of them are individually complete, they collectively establish a picture. You can read texts literally. What do they say? Sympathetically. What does its author intend? And you can also apply theories. So someone might refer to a feminist reading, or a queer lens, or a Marxist gaze, and so on. The critical thing to remember is while there are lots of incorrect ways to read your evidence, there is never just one correct way to do so. Today, I will focus on just one reading in the historian's toolkit. The idea of reading against the grain. Obviously, that is a play on the phrase against the grain, which means something that is difficult or uncomfortable. But it's not quite that simple. Uh, I feel the need to apologise for my discipline's pathological tendency to repurpose everyday words and phrases as technical terminology, because it does make methods rather obtuse. Reading against the grain did not begin as a historical term, but as a descriptive term in cinema studies. It appears in the late 70s and early 80s, initially to describe critics, especially feminists, with radical approaches to their subjects, and it was really taken on board as an idea by other subjects in the early 1990s. Philosophers used it as a synonym for the then trendy deconstruction, but in history it took on a slightly different meaning, to denote a way of reading information out of a source that it is not interested in giving you. Now, that is a little bit woolly, and like I say, this is a descriptive term. You will be frustrated if you go looking for historians giving a solid definition. Often, it's just used clumsily and pointlessly to mean critical. But amongst the ambiguity, there is a genuine technique which is worth practising. And that essentially comes in two parts. The first part, and actually the most important, is to identify what the grain is, while the second is to then read against that to elicit new information from the source. The grain is the natural way to read the text, which we tend to default into. And unless you think about it, you often don't recognise that there are in fact two distinct grains in most sources. The obvious grain is the author's goal, the objective that shapes the source, and which you might understand by a sympathetic or contextual reading. And then there is the grain of the community of scholars, the standard approach or interpretation, which is hard to unsee once you are exposed to it. OK, let me try and make this a bit more concrete with an actual example of a testimonial inscription. Inscriptions come in all shapes and sizes and serve a variety of purposes, as acts of piety, marks of ownership or legal records, by all sorts of people. But the group we are interested in, a very small minority, were put up on behalf of rulers and were intended to extol their power, virtues and achievements. Thus my label testimonial. Famous examples from South Asia include the Edicts of Ashoka, the Hathigumpha inscription, Kanishka I's Rabatak, which I will focus on today, Rudradharman's Yunagad rock inscription, or Samudragupta's 
Alabad pillar inscription. Presumably, almost every king who ever lived had multiple inscriptions of this type made, because kings are egotistical pricks who like to hear how great they are. But only a tiny handful survive. We don't even have an example for every major dynasty, let alone one for every king. In 1993, a photograph of the then newly discovered Rabatak inscription was delivered to the British Museum. The inscription was written in the Bactrian language, using a variant of Greek script, and had been found in Afghanistan. Based on the contents, and what we know of the context, it comes from a royal sanctuary called a Bagalago, literally House of the Lords. It was translated and published by Nicholas Sims Williams in 1996, who has subsequently published two more revised versions of the translation. Yes, there are other translations. If you go to Wikipedia, you will see one by B.N. Mukherjee. Don't touch it with a barge pole. The only reliable translations are those produced by Sims Williams. The inscription opens as follows. The Great Salvation, Kanishka, the Kushan, the Righteous, the Just, the Autocrat, the God, worthy of worship. This is not an exercise in modesty who has obtained the kingship from Nana and from all the gods, who has inaugurated the year one as the gods pleased, and he issued a Greek edict. OK, let us think about the grain here. Obviously, the text is about aggrandizing the king. That is its principal motive, the idea which gives it shape. He is righteous and just, ordained by gods, and the inscription tells us about deeds to reinforce that notion. This is the grain of the source. The second grain is easy enough to see when we look at the first article published on the inscription. This was uh, the second part after the translation by Sims Williams by Joe Cribb. Cribb writes, as exciting as the revelation of a new king might be, in many ways it is the context in which the name appears that is the most important contribution to Kushan history. Vima Takto is named as the second of three ancestors of Kanishka I. Their family relationships are also described. This gives us, for the first time, a firm structure for the history of the early Kushan kings. Crib is connecting the inscription with a debate that existed around the genealogy of the kings that had been going on for a long time in Kushan studies. The Rabatak inscription is an official document, and it could be mined for details about the structure, extent, or practices of the historical Kushan Empire. For the political historian or numismatist, like Cribb, who already worked with official products of the empire, it was terribly exciting. And this act of mining the inscription for nuggets of official information is the scholarly grain we need to be aware of. That grain is not idiosyncratic. It is how testimonial inscriptions have generally been used in South Asian history over the last century or two. Yes, it works at odds with the original author's intent of aggrandizement, and historians, because they are not naive, work to separate out the official record element of the inscription from the hyperbole of rhetoric around divine kings. So, for example, we assume that we can trust the inscription to accurately record the relative seniority of officers, like the Carol Rang or the Hashtwalg, but we do not need to build in the god's insurance of the king's health or victories into our chronology or political history. Except we can't really disentangle these so simply, and this is why it is important to read against the grain in the existing scholarship. The problem is most apparent in the fourth to sixth lines, which include a list of cities, most of them in the Gangetic Valley in northern India. The third through sixth are Saketa, Kosambi, Pataliputra, and Srikampa. The first two remain unidentified, with the translator resisting the suggestion of Ujjain for the second. The question of how far into India the Kushan Empire extended, like the genealogy, has long been a source of debate. And though the Rabatak inscription flatly contradicted the existing evidence, it was widely seen as resolving the issue, precisely by that process of mining out details the list was taken to demarcate the empire, or part of the list. You can see how the process of separating hyperbole and official records can become quite subjective here. 
and existing evidence was re-read to support that conclusion. And by and large, subsequent interpretations all followed this article. But there are problems with it. First of all, let me dispose of the other evidence. Yes, Kushan coins are found in this region, but almost always in hordes of a later date, and in many cases alongside local coins. And yes, there are inscriptions, but with one exception, though they are found in the Middle Ganges, they were in fact all made much further west at the city of Matara. Most importantly, we have pretty strong evidence for the existence of kingdoms which ruled this region in this period, for one of which, the Magas, both inscriptions and coins survive, which make no mention of the Kushans. So what is the Rabatak inscription really saying? Well, remember, it is trying to aggrandise the king, his person, office and achievements. It is not a boundary stone. In fact, it was erected hundreds of miles from the places it is listing. Now, we could just conclude that this is all an elaborate lie. After all, that is what politicians do. But I think we can elicit something from it. If we recognise that the Rabatak inscription has a grain, perhaps we can use that to read against it for information the author did not intend to communicate. Let me first detour and discuss the words Agita and Ustado. Sims Williams was unclear on the meaning of Agita in the original publication, initially taking it for whole, but subsequently based on the context in another Bactrian document for a capture or take hold. Ustado, since the first translation, has been read as submitted to, based on a cognate in Sogdian. I am sure these are the best possible readings available. The point here is not to challenge them, but to remind ourselves that we are dealing with a translation from a language known only from a modest number of records, including the Rabatak inscription itself. And we should be wary of reading too much into the English words capture or submitted. While the general intent of the original is clear, its exact nuance is hard to reconstruct. And remember, that general intent is to aggrandise the king. So let us talk about all the missing cities. The inscription lists six, but it doesn't mention any that we know are in the Kushan Empire, cities like Balkh, Taxila or Matara. Why? Well, obviously the cities are being connected to a military campaign under this king, one attested by other sources. But even within the region of the campaign, this is not a complete list. There are a lot more than six cities in this region. So why these six? Well, remember the point I've repeatedly made about the grain. These must be important cities. Cities whose submission, whatever precisely that means, could reflect the might and authority of the king. So what is the characteristic of these particular cities? Well, the inscription already implies it, and we independently know it to be true for two of them. Saketa was likely the capital of a dynasty known as the Mitras, and Kassam of the Magas. All of these would have been the political centres of independent polities. And now we have something. The king's power is only revealed by the submission of independent rulers. So what the Rabatak preserves is not as the traditional reading where nuggets of administrative, political, chronological data are mined for, suggests a demarcation of the boundaries of the empire, or, as the author would have it, a measure of the king's military prowess, but rather a political map of the middle and lower Ganges in the early 2nd century AD. One that is inherently interesting. Societies east of the Margas and Mitras do not make coins in this period, so without inscriptions, and very few survive, they are archaeologically invisible. Without Rabatak, we would not know that at this time the region of Magadha, with its centre at Pataliputra, was an independent kingdom, or that there was another around Sri Kampa. And thus, read against the grain, does the inscription yield something of value, quite unintended by the sycophantic officials responsible for its installation. Reading against the grain is not a complicated technique, nor should it ever be the sole reading of a text. But there is value, as in this case, of recognising the grain in the text. In this case, that it is about the Kushan king, or the grain of scholarship, that our job is to sift usable data about the Kushans from the hyperbole. 
as the scholarship on this inscription shows, while much of your reading is often with the grain, if you don't stop and ask these questions, it's easy to slip up in some part. And once you stop to ask, what is the grain? How might I read against it? You realise that the text has something to say entirely unrelated to its apparent subject. <laughs>